Amen. Remain standing and let's go to the book of Leviticus this morning, chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. I'll just read one verse to get us started today. Um, Many of you heard me announce last Sunday or maybe saw on social media that today we are covering the topic of the sanctity of life and abortion. I would just encourage you, um, as always, we have junior church provided, nursery provided as well. Um, If you have some younger ones, not that... um, we mean to be nasty or anything like that, but, but it is a heavy, heavy subject and maybe one that you don't want your children to hear or maybe want to hear come from you. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. Even if you have some older ones, sixth or seventh grade, they're welcome uh, today to join the junior church class and the workers know that as well. In Leviticus 18 and verse number 21, the Word of God says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. One more time. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Father, I pray that... um, As the message is delivered, Lord, you would give us open hearts and reasonable minds when we deal with this subject of the sanctity of life. God, if there's one here who is not saved, that today they would meet you, the one who is mighty to save. God, that you would forgive their sins and cleanse them and make them whole. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated today. I told uh, one of our men uh, yesterday, I feel like I'm trying to put the ocean into one of those Dixie cups out there in the coffee room. Uh, There's so much that you could say, so many different directions and avenues that you could take when talking about this particular subject, the subject of abortion. Um, As I was driving into the church early this morning, oftentimes my daughter, she's nine, she comes along with me. And uh, I usually have my notes out, and I'm just kind of looking through them a little bit as I make the five-minute drive from my house. And uh, she looked over, and she's never said this before, but she said, why do you have so many pages? (laughs) And I said, mind your beautiful old business over there, is what what I told her. And um, But I do have a lot that I I want to say, a lot that I'm going to say. Uh, If you were fearful of this service going long, you could have went to the early service, but you chose not to, okay? But, so I'm joking. I, I won't go much longer at all, really, than the early service. But um, I want to start, and I'll start this way, and I'll also end with this truth. That as a pastor, it's my heart as a shepherd, an under-shepherd of this congregation, not to just preach on this because it's a hot topic or sort of clickbait, but rather because... As a shepherd, I want you to understand the wickedness of abortion and how to respond to such wickedness. Um, Oftentimes as Christians, we're kind of backed into corners because we hear certain arguments when we don't know how to respond. And so today I want to try to bring a little bit of clarity to what this issue is all about. But I'll also say this, um, whether maybe you're here today and you've had an abortion personally, you know someone who's had an abortion, you've encouraged someone to have an abortion, or the slight chance that maybe even a doctor who's performed an abortion would hear this message somehow, I would like to say up front and remind you that um, there is mercy and there is grace and there is forgiveness and there is love and there is salvation found in the person of Jesus Christ to all those who will humble themselves repent of their sins, and put their faith in him. Amen? And I'll repeat that at the end as well. Let's be clear up front on what we're talking about when we say abortion. Abortion, according to the definition from Oxford Languages, is the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy. Once again, the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy. 
pregnancy, and that is the issue that we're talking about today. Maybe you knew, maybe you don't know, but abortion was the number one cause of human deaths worldwide. It usually is every year. It was in 2019 by far, with over 42 million killed by abortion. This was more than twice the number more than twice the number of all worldwide deaths caused by cancer, smoking, alcohol, traffic deaths, malaria, and HIV AIDS combined. 22% of pregnancies end in abortion. The United States of America aborts approximately 1.3 million babies every year. In comparison, that is as many abortions every year as the number of Americans who were killed in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World Wars I and II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Persian Gulf War, Iraq and Afghan Wars, all combined in one year. No doubt you've heard on Friday, June 24th, 2022, in a very historic decision, the Supreme Court officially reversed Roe v. Wade in a 5-4 to four decision which does away with the previous supposed constitutional right to abortion, meaning each state is now allowed to determine abortion access, which resulted, I should say, in many immediate bans across our nation, a decision that is already saving thousands of babies' lives. And that is something that we can praise God about. Praise God that since Roe v. Wade was overturned, Planned Parenthood clinics are closing down everywhere, which is sort of ironic because we've been told for so long that abortion was only 3% of Planned Parenthood's business. It is a time to praise. It is a time to celebrate. It is a time to rejoice. And don't let anyone tell you different. Don't let a pastor tell you different. I saw that one pastor stated that he wished Christians who are celebrating the overturning of Roe could see the anxious and fearful messages that he's been getting from women in his congregation all day. Women who think that way don't need to be coddled. They need to repent. They've been lied to for so long that they believe somehow their life will be drastically worse because they can't kill their baby. Enough with the insanity. What does it say about the state of our country that women are more terrified to have a baby than they are to have it killed? Romans 3.18 describes where we're at. There is no fear of God before our eyes. One particular Christian news source, remember last week we talked about that name Christian. We've got to be careful when we see that name used. One particular Christian news source, the Gospel Coalition, posted an article stating that it's not time for the church to beat its chest in celebration of victory in the culture war. This is a moment for us to step up and love. Well, of course we should step up and love. But we should also celebrate the end of a barbaric decision that was made almost 50 years ago protecting the murder of innocent children in the womb. If we can't celebrate that as a nation and as Christians, what can we celebrate? Let's help more and celebrate what God has done. Why not do both? It's also interesting that a lot of these kind of popular preachers didn't have any guts to say anything, not even to celebrate the decision of Roe v. Wade being overturned, because in reality they knew it would probably hurt their book sales. That doesn't make me more righteous or more godly of a pastor in any way at all. But almost immediately, those who are pro-choice and those who even claim to be pro-life played the sympathy card. Have a little compassion for the other side, Christians have been told. Quit bragging about your win. You're being sore winners. And I would say, well, excuse me. For 49 years we lost. 63 million times we lost. Heaven forbid that Christians celebrate for seven days. And even though this was a step in the right direction, let me remind you, we're nowhere close to abolishing abortion in our country as a whole. 
Christians have stayed quiet for too long on this issue, and we don't need to shut up about the amazing victory for life that this was if more believers were more bold to speak up and to speak out. Maybe this would have happened a long time ago. Somebody said abortion exists because the church allows it to. So don't let someone who is pro-death shame you or guilt you into feeling bad about celebrating life. And years from now, as we look back, and our prayer and our hope is that this practice of abortion would be completely done away with in just a memory in the history books, and our kids or our grandkids say, where were you, Mom? Where were you, Dad, when this was happening? Grandma, Grandpa, did you say anything? Did you do anything? This morning I would like to get to the heart of the abortion issue. What is the pro-choice issue, the abortion issue, really about? If I could make sort of an illustration... In the Old Testament, there were a group of people known as the Canaanites. They had many interactions with the Israelites. The Canaanites worshipped a plethora of false gods, false deities, many of which required certain sacrifices to be made. Now, many of the gods required sacrifice in order for the Canaanites to receive blessing and favor on their land. One of those such gods was called by the name Molech, also called Moloch. And he's referred to as other names in the Old Testament and throughout the Bible. Moloch, like these other gods, promised prosperity and favor if the right sacrifices were made. But unlike the other Canaanite gods, Molech required something specific. A sacrifice of a child. Throughout the Old Testament, God condemns the worship of Molech. Throughout the Old Testament, God reminds Israel what will happen to them if they participate in such wicked ceremonies. History tells us a little bit about what this worship of Molech looked like. Molech, the name means king. One particular ceremony involving worship of Molech, the Canaanites built a gigantic statue to Molech. Molech was in the image, he had the body of a man, the face or the head of a bull. So they created a large metal statue. People would then bring sacrifices to Molech, a grain sacrifice, or maybe a sacrifice or a lamb, or maybe even a bull. But Molech required something more. The greatest sacrifice that you could offer in worship to Molech was your own child. During the ceremony, Underneath the statue of Molech was a hollow place where they would build a fire. They would then heat the fire again and again until the point where the metal statue of Molech was piping red hot. It was glowing red. Then the mother or the father of the child would bring their child to the priest. The statue the body of a man, the head of a bull, sat down on a throne with its arms extended out like so. When the father handed his child to the priest, after the statue was heated to the point where it was glowing red, the priest would then take the child, placing it into the hands of Molech. The child would literally sizzle to death. Maybe you think, how in the world could any parent ever give their child to something so wicked, so vile, so cruel? How could they do it? I'll tell you how. 
there was a distraction. For all around the statue of Molech were drums. And as the, the ceremony began, the drums began to beat. And as the child was placed into the hands of the statue, the drums would get louder and louder and louder, drowning out the cries of the child, saying, so that the parents would not recant of their sacrifice. Friend, if we can get to the heart of the issue this morning, what is the abortion issue really about? I would say for 49 years, the drums of Molech have continued to play. For 49 years, distraction after distraction has been thrown in our face to get us to focus on anything but what's really going on. I'm sure over the past week you've heard many of these arguments. What about this situation? Well, what about in this scenario? Surely it's okay if this happens. My hope today is to stop the drums from playing, so to speak. The things that distract us from what's really going on the things that take away our focus from what's really happening, which is the slaughter and sacrifice of millions of innocent children in the name of abortion. That's what's happening. So let's go through these different beats of the drum, if you will, to get our focus off of the real issue. Let's begin. What about rape? What about incest? You've no doubt heard every one of these arguments, and I'm sure most of you have read or heard these arguments in the past week. Many cite rape and incest to justify abortion until birth. This is extraordinarily dishonest, even if pro-lifers agreed to exempt rape and incest Still, the pro-choice side wouldn't greenlight banning all other abortions. They're arguing edge cases because they can't argue the central case. It's just the drums to distract us from what's going on. Those that bring up these ideas or these situations, you have to understand, rape and incest account for less than 2% of all abortions. So those who bring up these numbers are only seeking to manipulate you and they want to ride on the back of someone else's tragedy to continue to commit murder for their convenience. In the book Victims and Victors, David Reardon and his associates draw on the accounts of 192 women who experience pregnancy as the result of rape or incest. It turns out that when victims of violence speak for themselves, their opinion of abortion is nearly unanimous and the exact opposite of what most would predict. Nearly all women interviewed said that they regretted aborting their babies conceived by rape or incest. Of those giving an opinion, more than 90% said they would discourage other victims of sexual violence from having abortions. Not one who gave birth regretted giving birth. Not one. Creating a second victim never undoes the damage to the first. Abortion does not bring healing to a rape victim. Instead, it adds more trauma. Listen, God takes rape very seriously. In Deuteronomy twenty-two twenty-five, it says this, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in a field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lie with her shall die. Somebody might think, what are you saying, we should kill the rapist? Sure. Yeah. Maybe that seems a little harsh. More harsh than killing the baby? How about... We have greater punishment for those who commit the crime. Stop slapping rapists and pedophiles on the wrist 
and stop telling the victim that the solution is to kill the child in her womb. I mean, what, a, what in essence are we saying to the rape victims? Aren't we telling them that now they're not as valuable because they've been raped? Because that's what we're telling the child conceived. That they're disposable because they were conceived in rape. Well, what does that mean for the mother who was raped? When murdering the child is the compassionate response to rape, we have been blinded. Here's an idea that I can get behind. Stop using 12-year-old rape, vi rape victims as shields for supporting adult women who kill their children for completely elective reasons. Rape, incest. What about the life of the mother? This, in my opinion, is the other top pro-choice argument. Not because it's a good argument, but because like the issue of rape and incest, it elicits emotion. By the way, all states that have abortion restrictions allow for any procedure that saves the life of the mother. The treatment of ectopic pregnancy is not abortion. The treatment for miscarriage is not abortion. The treatment for septic uterus is not abortion. There's a difference between losing a child and murdering a child. You say, well, you're getting into kind of, no, by the definition that I read at the very beginning, those things are not abortion. Also, from Planned Parenthood's website, they say, and I quote, treating an ectopic pregnancy isn't the same thing as getting an abortion. They know that. By the way, I haven't met a single pro-life person or seen a single pro-life organization who is seeking to fight to punish mothers who have a miscarriage. Can we stop with that as well? A miscarriage is not an abortion. A miscarriage is when a baby tragically dies. An abortion is when the baby is purposely killed. So here are the facts. The mortality rate of women who give birth in the United States is about 17 deaths per 100,000. That's 0.017%. Reasons for rape, incest, and the life of the mother make up less than 3% of all abortions. And that's a conservative and generous number. Some statistics show it's less than 2% for those given reasons. Less than 2%. Over 1,000 OBGYNs and maternal health care experts signed a statement back in 2012 saying this, as experienced practitioners in gynecology, we affirm that direct abortion, the purposeful destruction of the unborn child, is not medically necessary to save the life of a woman. Further, in 2019, Medical leaders representing more than 30,000 doctors said, and I quote, intentionally killing a late-term unborn baby in an abortion is never necessary to save a mother's life. This has never been about reproductive health. Former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop said, in 35 years of medicine, I have never seen one case where abortion was necessary to save a mother's life. And all of these men standing up for women's reproductive rights, women's health rights, as if they have some great courage, instead of speaking up for those children being slaughtered in the womb, what kind of man doesn't speak up for the most innocent of all life? These are the same men who would have told the Nazis where the Jews were hiding. You're not courageous, you're a coward. It's interesting when women say that men have no right to speak about women's productive rights. And yet many of those same women would claim that I can become a woman if I want. So do I need to identify as a woman in order for you to believe me when I say that abortion is wrong? Because whether I identify as a man, a woman, or a happy meal, it doesn't change the fact that abortion is wrong. Murder. I don't have to be a woman to read that in Exodus 20, 13, it says, Thou shall not kill. The mother's life, the woman's health, just another beat of the drum. 
poverty. The argument goes something like this. What kind of life will the child have? Growing up poor, not having food to eat. What kind of quality of life is that? Raise a hand. How many of you grew up poor? When I lived with my mom, we lived paycheck to paycheck. She was a waitress. We were just hoping, my brother and I, as she was at work, that she would come home with enough money and tips so that we could pay for another night in the hotel that we were living in. Is my life less valuable because I grew up poor? So the solution to poverty is then to kill the child because he, by the way, might grow up poor? Abortion doesn't eliminate poverty, it just eliminates the poor. But that's not what this is about. Single women who earn 47,000 plus in a year abort 32% of their babies. Single women making 11,000 a year or less abort only 8.6% of their babies. A poor woman is more than five times as likely to have an unintended birth, yet four times less likely to have an abortion. This is not about desperation. This is not about poverty. Let's be real. And the one that maybe, it all bo- it's all bothersome, but maybe the one that bothers me the most and the one that I you know, don't even want to get started on is abortion because the child may have deformities. How sick can you be? So if you, go, if you grow up poor or mentally or physically handicapped, I guess you have to hear for the rest of your life that you're the reason that abortion should be legal. You're the reason that mothers ought to have the ability to kill their child in the womb because of you. It's just another distraction. Some cry, separation of church and state. Religion doesn't have any right to determine what a woman does with her body. Keep your Bible out of it. Separation of church and state. Friend, we don't want the state to be the church. We just want the state to be the state, and God created the state first and foremost to protect life. And the life that needs protect the most in our country right now, at this very moment, is the unborn child in the womb. God created government to protect life, and he put the highest premium on human life. Why? Because only human beings are created in the image of God. This is the reason God gave Israel the permission to destroy life when the sixth commandment was broken. In Genesis 9, 6, from the beginning we see the value and the sacredness of life when God says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. So precious is life. God says if you destroy it, your life will be required in return. The highest responsibility of the government is to protect life. Yet this goes back to the old, you can't legislate morality argument. It's interesting because the Bible also condemns rape. Do we want that out of our laws too? By the reaction of some people, you would think that the government gave permission to kill children through abortion. Planned Parenthood writes just recently, The court's decision most harms black, Latino, indigenous, and other people of color communities for whom systemic racism has long blocked access to opportunity and health care. Really? Sort of ironic coming from Planned Parenthood, whose founder, Margaret Sanger, wrote, We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population who called immigrants human weeds. The Guttmacher Institute reports, this much is true, and I quote, in the United States, the abortion rate for black women is almost five times that of white women. Yet the population of white women is almost five times the population of black women. 
So the population of black women is five times less than white women, and yet black women have five times more abortion in the United States. But keep telling me that this decision is going to harm people of color. Abortion is the number one killer of black lives in the United States more than cancer, heart disease, HIV, and all other deaths combined. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that overturning Roe v. Wade is harmful to communities from people of color. Still, you hear the cries of those who say, well, if you don't want an abortion, don't get one. Don't have one. If you think abortion's wrong, then don't get an abortion. It's not okay to impose your religious views on others. Why should others have to live according to your interpretation of the Bible? Okay? If you think stealing is wrong, don't steal. But don't put your religious views on me. How about if you don't think slavery is wrong, then don't own a slave? Huh. Because that's, that's exactly what they said. But don't impose your religious views on others who want to own a slave. If you think murder is wrong, don't kill anyone. But don't impose your religious views on others. You see how this works? By the way, it seems like those who are pro-choice, pro-abortion, they're ready to go. They're ready to talk to you. They're ready to say something. But I'll tell you this, they're not prepared when you say something back. See, they are, in a way, soft right now because they've been believing the same lies for so long and no one has challenged them on it, challenged them a little bit, and their entire argument unravels. And I've done this, and the default is this. Well, most abortion happens before 21 weeks. 21 weeks, that's, that's when most abortion happens anyways. Okay? Jacob, will you put that picture up? This is a, a depiction of a baby at 21 weeks old. This, he, is what the pro-choice side says, it's only 21 weeks. 21 weeks. He can feel pain. He can get hiccups. He can have dreams. He can grab his umbilical cord. He has taste buds and can taste what his mama eats. And he can suck his own thumb. So next time someone says, yeah, but it happens at 21 weeks or less, show him a picture like this and say, and? Does that make it better or worse? Then you hear this, you're only pro-birth. Pro-life people, you're only pro-birth. You don't care for life after the womb. This is another false personal attack that distracts from physically killing babies. Many are saying now that Roe is overturned. Christians, Christians need to foster and adopt children and care for pregnant women and single mothers and provide counseling and resources. In other words, they're saying that now that Roe is overturned, Christians need to keep doing all the stuff they've been doing for decades. Pregnancy resource centers outnumber Planned Parenthood three to one in our country. According to live action, in one year, pro-life pregnancy resource centers served 1.8 million people, provided $276 million in free services, gave parenting courses to 313,000 people, provided 1.2 million packs of diapers, and supplied 2 million baby outfits. Orphanages, missionaries, free clinics, soup kitchens, hospitals, charities, Christians have always cared about life. And don't let anyone tell you different. And by the way, Christians have always cared about life. Statistically, we show that more than anyone else. According to Ethics Daily, 5% of practicing Christians in the United States have adopted. 5% 
of practicing Christians in the United States have adopted, which is more than twice as much as all other adults from beliefs and religions and backgrounds combined. Sounds like some other people need to start stepping up, huh? I want you to consider as well, currently in the United States, they estimate there to be 400,000 in foster care. 400,000 children in foster care. At the same time, they estimate that there are 2 to 3 million people in the United States alone waiting to adopt. Can we quit blaming Christians? But here's the point. Whether an individual has adopted five children or none doesn't change the fact that abortion kills a child. It's just another distraction, just another beat of Molex drum. What if Christians didn't do any of the things that I mentioned? So what? Adoption, fostering, supporting single mothers, donating to pregnancy resource centers, volunteering. These things are all well and good, but you don't have to do any of them to be pro-life. How many babies an individual has adopted has nothing to do with the morality of abortion? To put it another way, if someone said, how many human, human trafficking victims have you taken in and cared for? You said, well, none. Well, then you can't speak against it. How absurd. What does a Christian not adopting a child after they're born have to do with the doctor killing one before it's born? I have never fostered or adopted a child in 32 years of my life, and abortion is still murder. It's still wrong. Just another distraction. So what's really going on? What are these drums covering up? It's all to drown out the sound of what's really happening and what's really happening. Let me tell you, or rather, let me allow a pro-abortion, pro-choice person to tell you. What's really happening? Some of you who are in Sunday school, you've heard me read this. But in an article in Salon Magazine, Mary Elizabeth Williams wrote a jarring piece titled, So What If Abortion Ends Life? In the article, Williams presents what used to be a pro-life argument, that the baby in the womb has personhood, but concludes that the baby's life is more expendable than that of the mother's life, and for that reason should not be legally protected. Here's what she wrote. I believe that life starts at conception, and it's never stopped me from being pro-choice. Listen to her reasoning. I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life, and that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. I have friends who have referred to their abortions in terms of scraping out a bunch of cells, and then a few years later were excited over the pregnancies that they unhesitatingly described in terms of the baby and this kid. I know women who have been relieved at their abortions and grieved over their miscarriages. Why can't we agree that it's pretty silly to pretend that what was growing inside of them wasn't the same thing. When we try to act like a pregnancy doesn't involve human life, we wind up drawing stupid semantic lines in the sand. First trimester abortion versus second trimester versus late term, dancing around the issue, trying to decide if there's a single magic moment when a fetus becomes a person. She asked, are you only human when you're born? only when you're viable outside of the womb? Are you less of a human life when you look like a tadpole than when you can suck on your own thumb? If by some random fluke I learned today I was pregnant, you bet I'd have an abortion. I'd have the world's greatest abortion. My conviction is that the fetus is indeed a life, a life worth 
sacrificing. Church, that is the heart of the abortion issue. That's what the drums are covering up. That's what they want to distract us from. Sacrifice. You know, the state of Florida records a reason for every abortion that occurs within its borders each year. In 2020, there were approximately 75,000 abortions in Florida. Here are the reasons listed and the percentage of abortions that occurred because of it. 0.01% the pregnancy resulted from an incestuous relationship. 0.01%. 0.15% the woman was raped. 0.2% the woman's life was in danger by the pregnancy which amounts to, in those three arguments, the most major arguments that pro-choice people use, that amounts to less than half a percent for 75,000 abortions. That means 99 plus percent of abortions that occurred in the state of Florida in 2020 were for reasons other than rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Sometimes, Pro-life people can just be bombarded by the pro-choice arguments. And, and then we start, to, we start to kind of lose focus of what's really going on. And we, we kind of get sucked into it and we think, oh man, that's, that's so tragic, rape, and, and it is, and, and then incest, and what about the life of, of the mother? And, and, and that child, they're going to grow up in an abusive home and be beaten and, and probably addicted to drugs straight out of the womb. And, and, and you kind of start getting sucked into the emotionalism of it. And then you have to say, wait. And you have to step back and say, no. It's still a child. It's still a child. Open your eyes to what's really going on. The next time you talk with someone and they use one of these reasons for why abortion should be legal, ask them this, would you be okay to outlaw every other reason for abortion? Maybe they don't know that that includes 97% of all other abortion, but there's a good chance they do know, and their answer would be no. They're not okay with it. They're not all right with outlawing all other abortion because that's not what this is about. And the people fighting for abortion rights, they don't want abortion safe, legal, and rare. They want abortion on demand for any reason. And they don't really care about the 3%. The president of the United States of America is the most pro-murder president we have ever had. Our president wants abortion legal up until the day of birth. So what's really at stake here? If it's not for the 3%, what's really at stake? I'll tell you, what's really at stake in the vast majority of abortions is the mother's lifestyle. They want us to think that it's reasonable for a society to kill a child instead of being temporarily inconvenienced. And the fight for freedom of choice is really the fight to have sex with whoever you want, whenever you want, without any consequences of doing so. That child might interfere with your dreams so you have the right to get rid of them. Here's the truth. They know that it's a child. They know. City councils in Portland, Oregon, and Boston recently launched new policy permitting city employees to take paid leave after having an abortion. In Boston, the city council amended its paid uh, parental leave policy to include employees suffering from pregnancy loss. This might sound as though the policy applies only to parents who lost a child after maybe stillbirth or miscarriage, but in fact, the policy also includes those who, I quote, experience a termination. In other words, those who have had an abortion. So they're giving them paid leave. Why? because they know it's a child. Kelly Osborne, who's an outspoken pro-abortion advocate, on one of her social media posts is chanting and cheering and raving for the 
reproductive rights of women and for abortion, and in the other post, ranting and raving about her baby in the womb and how excited she is. Chrissy Teigen and John Legend, a Hollywood couple, lost a child maybe a year or so ago. Many people reached out in sympathy, including such Planned Parenthood messaged them saying, we're sorry to hear of your loss. Why? What loss? Were they saddened over the loss of potential life? Or was life actually lost? They know it's a child. Again, our president, who supports abortion up until the moment of birth, he said multiple times, aborting the child, abort the child. Now, much smarter pro-choice people won't use the phrase child, but he keeps forgetting. They know it's a child. Even Planned Parenthood admits that having an abortion is a difficult decision to make. Why? If it's not a life and it's just a clump of cells and nothing more and nothing less, then why is it a difficult decision? It should be the easiest decision to make if it's not a life. One pastor said if we found on Mars what we find in the womb, there would be no doubt life was discovered. And how ironic that in one part of a hospital, doctors may be working tirelessly to save the life of a premature baby born before 24 weeks, and in another room of the hospital, doctors may be performing an abortion on a baby at exactly the same age. The hypocrisy is deafening. One pastor in an Atlanta church right after lamenting the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, boasting of how we need as Christians to protect women's rights, a.k.a. the right to abortion, murdering children, then called parents forward for a baby dedication. Isaiah 5, verse 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I want you to understand, Christian, not all pro-choice advocates, but many on the other side are crude and hateful and vile. Some of the most vile people I've ever seen. Be prepared. Their God has just been pushed over. Their idol has been knocked down and the worshipers of Molech will not go quietly. You want to know the real reason abortion exists? What's the heart of the issue? It's found in John 3, verse number 19. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. I think it's time that the drums stop. Joni Erickson Tata said, though gradually, though no one remembers exactly how it happened, the unthinkable becomes tolerable and then acceptable and then legal and then applaudable. Don't be fooled. Don't let the cries of the children being killed in abortion be drowned out by the drums all around us. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned, I know that you have seen all the same arguments. And and what do you see? What do you hear? What do you see on social media? What about rape? What about the mother's life? Ectopic pregnancy. When the reality is most abortions are on healthy women aborting healthy children for elective reasons. And it's not the mother's life but her lifestyle that's in jeopardy. And in our sex-crazed society, women and men want to be free of consequence, free of responsibility. In our self-love, self-affirmation, do-what-makes-you-happy culture, what's really hiding behind those drums? The number one reason for abortion, convenience. Convenience. Let me close with three quick thoughts. 
to summarize. Number one, abortion is murder. Job 31, verse 15, the Word of God says, Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? Abortion is the killing of a human being created in the image of God. Abortion is murder. Number two, life is sacred. Psalm 139, verse 13, the psalmist writes, For thou hast possessed my reins. He's saying, you've, you've knitted me together. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Life is sacred. God knows the number of our days before we even have one. Each and every person created and formed by God is unique and valuable. No matter how they're conceived, no matter how they're raised or the conditions they might live in, and no matter what deformities we might say they have. Abortion is murder. Life is sacred. Number three, Jesus saves. What hope does the person involved with an abortion have? As much hope as any other sinner. A woman who has had an abortion, a man who has encouraged an abortion, and a doctor who has performed an abortion, all can be forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ. And when you're in Christ, Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. One pastor put it this way, if we were God, we wouldn't save adulterers and murderers like David, religious terrorists like Paul, doubters like Thomas, deniers like Peter, or wretched sinners like you and me. The liar needs just as much forgiveness and salvation as the woman who's had an abortion. By the way, being pro-life isn't going to get you into heaven. Having conservative values doesn't mean you're in Christ. But there is forgiveness for all sin. Say, even that, Pastor Nathan? Yeah, even that. Romans 5.20 Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in you. And if you will fall on him, repent of your sin and turn to Jesus, he will forgive you, he will cleanse you, and he will make you new. That's the promise that we have. Would you stand with me this morning? As you stand, if you would bow with me for just a moment. With heads bowed, eyes closed, just quickly. First, first, if you're here today, I'm not asking what type of sin you have. I'm asking, have you repented of the sin you have? Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Have you done that? Christian, uh, maybe you're here. You say, Pastor Nathan, I have done that, but I need to do a little bit more. Why well, won't you come today? But if you're here and you've not been saved, this invitation is for you, first and foremost. I want to invite you. As we begin to sing, step out of that aisle. Take the hand of the one next to you. I'm sure they'd be glad to come with you. Allow for us to share with you. I'll share with you personally how you can be saved. You can be forgiven, friend. There's more mercy in Christ than sin in you. Christian, it's probably a good Sunday to gather around this altar and thank God for the life that he's given us, the victories of life that we've seen recently, and for courage that God would use us to speak out and stand up and cry out for those who do not have a voice. Let me invite you to come, Christian. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness that you offer through your son, Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. We truly have not done enough. 
lay someone on our heart this week that we can bless, Lord, that, that you can use us to minister to, to care for. Give us a heart for people, all life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some have already come. I invite you to come, Christian. You come. If you need to be saved, why don't you come today? When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your Just bow for a moment as these pray. Just give them some time. Christian, what can you do? You say, I'm already doing some things, Pastor Nate. Well, then keep it up. Can you do something else? Our world says all the time that Christians don't care about life. Just life in the womb. Well, then we ought to prove them, prove them, prove them wrong. Maybe there's still one here who's never been saved. Why don't you come? What could bring you more peace, more hope than hearing that all your sins can be forgiven, washed away? You come. Let's continue to sing on that next verse. God's people said, let's close with a word of prayer. Brother Mark, would you pray for us?